Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. We are gathering together, Lord, to hear from you. God, we know that you're going to meet us here, Lord. But for right now, God, we just want to invite you. We want to invite you into this place, Lord. God, we invite your presence, your healing presence, God. Lord, your, your communing presence, God. You want us to come and sit. You invite us to sit at the table with you, Lord, and to be with you and to hear from you, Jesus. So we're here today, God, this morning because we know we need you. We need you to start off this week just with you, loving you, worshiping you, communing with you, hearing from you, God. Lord, because only your words give life. Only your words give us hope. Only your words give our lives meaning, Jesus. Lord, we pray for purpose over this congregation. We pray, God, for your presence, your blessing, Lord, to be upon our people, Lord. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would come and meet with us, Lord. We love you. We worship you. We lift up the name of Jesus. We give you all the glory, everything, all that is due to your name, Lord. We give you to you, Lord. You are the only one that is good and able. Lord, you're the only one that can hear our prayers, Lord. You're the only one that is actually able to do anything about it, God. So that we're not going to waste any time. We're going to stay here until we need you, until we need you to move, Lord. We're going to stay right here in your presence and talk to you and wait on you because we know that in your hands there is fullness of joy in your presence there is fullness of joy so god we love you we extend our hands we extend our hearts god we're not waiting we're not holding anything back today god we need you lord more than yesterday more than next week god we need you for the tomorrows but we're not so sure of god we thank you lord because you're the only one you're the firm foundation you're the rock on which we stand God, we thank you because you are unshakable, you are immovable. God, there is nobody that can replace you, nobody that can do anything that you do, Lord. You are the creator, you're the beginning and the end, you're the alpha and the omega. So God, we're talking about you, Lord. We're glorifying you right here, right now, God. We're glorifying you, we're lifting up the name that is above every other name. We thank you because there is a resurrected name and his name is Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Because death, hell, and the grave could not hold you. Lord, we love you. And so we give you all of the glory and the praise. All of the glory is due to your name. So we give it all to you this morning. All to you this morning. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy. Hallelujah to your name.
worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you all the glory, God, for you alone are worthy to be praised. Jesus, we love you. We're here for you, my God, to have an encounter with you, Jesus. Inhabit the praises of your people, oh God. Have your way, Jesus.
to be praised. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We give you the glory, God. Hallelujah. Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You were just doing what you were made to do. We were created to worship him. If we can get the flesh out of the way and do what we were designed to do, submitting this flesh, making it a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is his which is our reasonable service. The word service there actually means worship. It's our reasonable worship to give ourselves. You ought to try it sometime. You ought to lift up your voice sometime if you've never done it. You ought to clap your hands unto the Lord or lift up holy hands unto God. You ought to jump a little for Jesus. That'd be all right. Give him worship. There's a Hebrew word that actually 
is translated as worship and it means leap for joy. Go ahead and do it for the Lord. Amen. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. It's the peace of God that passes all understanding. Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful presence of the Lord. Amen. You need this and I need this. This is one reason why we need to be in church because of this kind of atmosphere. Amen. Thank you all for coming and being a part of what God is doing today at the Pentecostals of Cooper City. You may be seated and we definitely want to welcome all of our guests, all of our regular saints of God, all of you who are joining us online, we are so glad that you are connecting with what God is doing this morning. We're grateful to have you join us today, both in person, online. If you are new here, we would love to connect with you. You matter. You are important to us. And we have a way that we can connect with you even a little more. You'll see in the pew in front of you that connect card. If you fill that out and after the service, take it to our welcome center and it will open up a door for us to be able to minister to you more and show you opportunities for you to be involved in the work of God. And you'll be able to get communications from the church if you so desire. And we have a special gift there for you also. So please fill that out. You can also do it online. You'll see that card and you can fill out that information. Aren't you thankful for a God who loves you? Even when you are at your worst, he still loves you. Now he wants you to repent, of course, and turn back to him, but he still loves us and he's reaching for us. He'll never let us go. Our Easter theme for 2024 with our special theme, Love That Won't Let Go, will be Sunday, March 31st, so a week from today, special Easter services. And you know it's going to be a packed house. We have both services here. Then, of course, there's a service at our Coral Springs campus. Invite somebody to come. A great time of the year to invite family or maybe somebody who has been promising to come with you. Easter may be that time that they'll take that step. I was baptized on an Easter Sunday night many, many, many years ago. So I'm about to celebrate my birthday here. And uh, it was because somebody invited me to come and I was invited by the Holy Ghost dealing with my heart but also by a person who invited me to come. Easter is a great time, and it was on that Easter Sunday night that I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't underestimate what God can do in one church service. So allow God to have his way. You can get those connect cards, or I'm sorry, the uh, invite cards on the tables as you are exiting out this morning. Thank you all who give so faithfully. And you have been so generous to support all the amazing things that happen at POCC week in and week out. We're involved in so many missionary efforts, whether it be in other countries or here in the U.S. We want to reach our community. We want to reach our world. And you can give electronically on our website at coopercitychurch.org. You can text POCC to... 77977 or you can give this morning in the offering so we're going to go to the lord in prayer today and we're going to pray for the remainder of this service we have something very special today as we celebrate the time of year which looks back at the suffering death of jesus christ for the remission of our sins the shedding of his blood his burial and his resurrection let's go to the lord father you have been so good to us thank you for all that you are doing we just pray now lord that you would work in 
all of our lives, in all of our families, in our community, in our nation, and around the world. We pray that you would take this offering now, multiply it for the kingdom of God, that it would advance your cause. Lord, we pray right now that you would receive the worship through the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.
one shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. 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 And the old preacher said it this way, you can bow now or bow later, but you're going to bow. Welcome to Palm Sunday. Welcome to all of our guests, our friends, our family. We're so blessed to have you on this most special day. It's good to have the Martins here with us. Martin and Martin, praise God. We're welcoming you. Thank God for all of our church family, so many that are here visiting and some that are traveling away, but we're glad that you're here. At the beginning of the service, you should have received, or at the entrance, we're getting ready at the end of the service to take communion. And I know there's many prayer requests also at the end of the service after communion. We're gonna be praying for you. I'm excited because we are, we are knowing, we know the season, the reason of this season. We know the reason of the season of Christmas, but we know the reason of the season of this special week, the Holy Week, the week of Easter, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and what it means. And today we are going to hear a word from the Lord. We're so thankful for Pastor Bibi going to bring us the word today, and he's going to bless you. Get ready to receive what the Lord has, and at the conclusion we'll be taking communion together. In Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. Amen, amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? You feel that presence so powerful just a moment ago? Amen, amen. Today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday in Scripture tells the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. If you're like me, you may think of the stories of the gospel as all kind of centering in and around Jerusalem. However, that's not actually the case. Not the blessing of going to Jerusalem uh, two years ago, and it's a it's a proper country. You know, Israel has miles and miles and days worth of journey that you can travel and most of the life of Christ and the life of the disciples orbited around Jerusalem and outside of uh, his time as a child entering into Jerusalem with his parents we don't see a ton of Jesus's ministry happening in Jerusalem but his fame has begun according to scripture to be noised abroad people all around in Galilee and Judea and Capernaum and all throughout the region have begun to know this Jesus, begin to celebrate him. Many have been healed and delivered. And I'm, I'm sure there was always an anticipation that one day he would make it to the city of David and Jesus and Jerusalem would come together and something magnificent would happen. The story of Palm Sunday Jesus makes that, as scripture calls it, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the people are waiting with anticipation, expectation for the arrival of this one that they have heard can do anything. He can do anything. And now he has come to our capital city and the people line the streets as if a procession of a king has come and they line the streets and those that planned ahead have climbed trees and cut down palm fronds and placed them in their hands and those who didn't plan ahead this would have been me they've taken off their coats and they've lined the streets and as Jesus marches down the road of Jerusalem they begin waving those palm branches and they begin waving their coats and they begin shouting aloud Hosanna 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 and for one day in the life of Christ he was given the worship and the praise and the glory that he was worthy of on that day he was celebrated like he was deserving of and I wonder if for the next 30 seconds we could give him some praise like that praise that he's worthy of praise that he's earned praise that he's deserved Hosanna Hosanna blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord hallelujah now I wish 
I could take the next 30 minutes and preach on that. But today we are going to take communion. And our attention is going to shift to later in that holy week. Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22? Luke chapter 22. Pastor mentioned a moment ago the conclusion of this service. Um, we're going to invite you to come. Come down to this altar and join as a family, as a church family, and take communion together. Now, I might get in trouble for this, but when we say we're going to invite you to come, that means all of you. Sometimes we say, would you come to the altar? And about 20% get the, get the message. Today, it would be awesome if we could all come together, together to, to remember the blood and the cross and the grave and the resurrection as one body, as one family. So at the conclusion of this sermon, pastor will come back, the invitation will be made, and we're going to expect God to move amongst us. Such a pleasure and an honor to preach to you. You're the greatest church in all the world. It's such a pleasure to be a part of. God's met with us today, and we expect he's going to continue. Then came the day of unleavened bread and when the Passover must be killed. And he, meaning Jesus, sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, behold, when you enter into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is thy guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I've really wanted to enjoy this Passover dinner with you before my suffering begins. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I, I will not eat of this Passover supper again. This will be the last time. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. This is the last time I'll drink of the fruit of the vine with you. For I say, uh, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this or this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Today, I want to preach to you from that passage and from this title, Never Forget to Remember. Never Forget to Remember. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Memory. One author stated, memory is a way of holding on to things you love, the things you are, and the things you never want to lose. The famed Greek philosopher Aristotle stated, memory is the scribe of the soul. One of America's greatest philosophers, Dr. Seuss, said it like this. Sometimes you will never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Memory is one of the many God-given features that humanity has that separates us from the rest of creatures of the creatures of the earth. It is true that some animals exhibit extraordinary abilities to recall things and, and these displays often shock and amaze us. 
due to their uh, complex social structures, structures, their geographical recall, and their ability to communicate and learn. We've all heard the phrase, help me if you've heard this, elephants never forget. You forgot, my goodness. We have all seen dogs or cats trained to remember certain tasks and tricks. Some birds and even sea life have demonstrated the ability to remember and even teach their young travel routes that can span thousands of miles. While these things are true, we humans enjoy a much broader and dynamic ability to remember. Our memories are what allow us to do things other creatures cannot do, such as read and write and do complex math. I cannot do complex math, but we as a human race can. Amen. Humans show unordinary levels of long-term memory not present in the animal kingdom. Oftentimes, being able to recall things in great detail that happened 60, 70, or even 80 years prior. Humans also have what is referred to as adaptable memory. Our memories can be shaped and organized and reorganized by experiences, emotions, and environmental factors. This allows us to do risk uh, assessment analysis, to factor risks and consequences, and to make complex decisions not based solely off of our instinct. This is not an accident, and it's not just the outcome of winning the evolutionary biological lottery. We were created in the image of God. He imbued us with his qualities that none of his other creations were gifted. God gave us his emotions, his creativity, his complexity, and he gave us the ability to remember. Of course, memory has served humanity in remarkably important ways. If you go back far enough, there was not Google. Some on the front row here have no remember, memory of no Google. Those of us that are aged, I'm getting there. You ever do this? You're sitting around with your friends and you're trying to remember who wrote that song? Who sang that? Who, who was it that said this quote? And we'll, we will rack our memories trying to remember. And then somebody will go, let's ask Google. And we go, oh yeah, oh. We were, we were not conditioned that way. But before there was Google and back when there was no internet, even before there was a farmer's almanac and a Cyclopedia Britannica, before there were books and writing, people simply had to remember which berries go good in a pie and which berries will kill you. You had to remember that. In that process, somebody thought it was a good idea to you know, the two major divisions of berries, there are poison berries and edible berries. And somebody decided to name one of the edible berries, boysen berries. That joke didn't work at nine or 11. I've got to stop trying that joke. People had to remember when to plant, which crops, into what kind of soil. Over time, our most distant ancestors would remember the travel patterns of their food sources, when and where to find water in dry seasons, and which herbs and plants could remedy an ailment. Without the ability to remember, it is unlikely the human race survives until today. And if it did, it would not be to the level that we have progressed. God allowed us to remember so that we could survive and progress as a species. However, this was not the only function of our memory. All throughout God's word, he commands his people to remember. In Genesis, God gives Noah a rainbow to serve as a reminder of the Noahic covenant that he would never again flood the earth. And Abraham, God gives the sign of circumcision to remind future generations of the Abrahamic covenant that out of Abraham's seed would come a blessing for all peoples. And the Ten Commandments declares unto us, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15 says, and remember 
remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the, the Lord thy God command thee keep the Sabbath day. The Lord said, remember that there was a time when you were in Egypt. You were bound by chains and ruled by taskmasters. Remember there was a time you were not a nation and a people unto yourself. You did not govern or lead your own lives. But one day God himself came down and with a strong hand pulled you out of bondage. Remember, God says, don't forget Egypt and don't forget that it was me who brought you out. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he would swear unto thy fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not and houses full of good things which thou fillest not and wells digged which thou diggest not and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not and when thou shalt have eaten and be full then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God spoke to his people and he told them in Deuteronomy chapter five, he said, don't forget I brought you out of Egypt. Don't forget that you were once a bond slave. Don't forget you were once bound and not set free. And then I reached down with my strong hand and I brought you out. But I didn't just bring you out, but I brought you in. I brought you into blessing. I brought you into promise I brought you into power and glory I gave you things you didn't deserve I gave you homes you didn't build and vineyards you didn't plant anybody can testify for a moment I once was lost in sin but Jesus took me in and I'm not bound anymore God said you need to remember me in Egypt and you need to remember me in promise. You need to remember when you have nothing and you need to remember when you have everything. When you were in bondage, I brought you out. And when you found prosperity, it was because I brought you out. Don't forget me. I think some people get the wrong impression that Christians were rehabilitated. That once we were bad and then we came to church and went through a 12 step process and met with our counselor and our coach and we worked and whittled away at this and that and added this and that and eventually we became upstanding citizens and we expect you to do the same thing. That is not the testimony of scripture. We were not rehabilitated. He found me when I was no good and by his own strength and by his own power, he made something out of me. The only reason I'm here today is because of Jesus. He's the only reason I live. He brought me out of bondage and he brought me into light. He gave me every good thing. I wish I had somebody that could testify with me for a moment. I once was bound by drugs. I once was bound by alcohol. I once was bound in my heart and mind. But I've been set free and I will not forget. How could I forget what he's done for me? How can I forget how he set me free? Come on, somebody. Do you remember where you were? When Jesus came and found you, Jesus said, or scripture says, over and over again, Moses tells the children of Israel by the direction of God, don't forget the manna in the wilderness. 
You remember when you didn't have money to get through the week? You had more bills to pay than cash to pay it with. You didn't have food in the cupboards and you had hungry kids. And then somehow those dollars just stretched. Somehow a miracle came through. Somebody placed a $20 bill in your hand when you didn't expect it. Just somehow there was manna in the wilderness. There was provision where you didn't expect it. The hand of God just showed up. You said, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And then you got a raise on the job you probably weren't qualified for. But Jesus came through with manna in the wilderness. Don't forget that your clothes never withered away and your shoes never wore out. Remember, remember, teach, teach your children and teach your grandchildren. When they wonder why we worship, we have to remind them we haven't always been in the promised land. Your kids are going to be born into the promised land. Your grandchildren are going to be born in Canaan. Your kids are going to be born in the church. Your kids are going to be born into the house of God. They're not going to remember where you came from. God told Joshua when it was time to go from the wilderness into the promised land. He said, when the priest's feet touch the Jordan River, the waters will stop flowing and you'll march through on dry ground. No doubt this was meant to be as a reminder of coming out of Egypt. God said, when they step into the river, the waters will stop. But there's something I want you to do. I want you to take 12 stones on this side of Jordan and I want you to carry it into the water or where the water was and I want you to lay it down. And I want you to pick up 12 stones that are in the Jordan River and carry it out to the other side. Now, I don't have time to preach on baptism today, but if I did, I would tell you there's some things that you carry into the water and you leave it there. There's some things that you carry into the water, but it don't come out with you on the other side. I carried shame and guilt and embarrassment. I carried a tormented mind. I carried anger and bitterness and strife. I, I carried all sorts of things into the water. But when I got into the water and the preacher called that name over my life, I left some things in the water. But you don't just leave things in the water. They say, God said, Joshua, I want you to pick some things up and carry it to the other side. Because when you get baptized in the water, you lay some things down, yes. But you pick some things up, yes. You lay down strife and you pick up peace. You lay down depression and you pick up joy. You lay down a broken past and you pick up a blessed future. There's some things you pick up in the water. Amen. Listen, I've been here for 15 years. I know some of y'all's testimonies. I know where God has brought some of you from. God forbid any of us, I'll just preach to myself for a second. God forbid any of us become professional Christians and we come to church and we clap on two and four or on one and three. I don't know which one it is. We clap on the right beat and we pray when we pray and we altar call and when they make the altar call, we get to the car because we got to beat, beat potential church to the restaurant. <laughs> got to hurry. There's some things we've got to remember. God told Joshua, take 12 stones and build them as a memorial. What for, God? Because there's going to come a generation. They don't, they're not going to remember the wilderness and they're not going to remember Egypt. And they, all they're ever going to know is promise. All they're ever going to know is peace. All they're ever going to know is joy. All they're ever going to know is freedom. But when they see the memorial, they're going to say, Mom and Dad, what's the memorial for? What's the 12 stones for? And you're going to tell them, we haven't always been free. We haven't always been delivered. We haven't always been in Canaan. We haven't always been ruled by our king. We haven't always been able to freely worship. But he brought me out of the miry clay. He reached down and found me. And he reached down and found you. 
Amen. We don't simply have enthusiastic worship services because we're Pentecostal. A moment ago, they, that second song they sang, the presence of God moved in here. You heard, you can hear people calling out to Jesus, lifted hands, there were people dancing across the front, waving and lifting their voices and singing aloud. There was people crying and people laughing. There were people kneeling and people running. And we're not just doing that to live up to some cultural tradition. We're not just doing that because the sign says Pentecostal. We're not just doing that because it's what's expected of apostolics. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. I once was bound. I once was not in my right mind. I once didn't know what step to take, but Jesus found me. Jesus found me. Come on, let's give him some praise. Let's give him some glory. Let's give him some worship. To whom much is given, much is required. If God has done something for you, you ought to give him some praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why do you act like that, Pentecostals of Cooper City? It's the overflow of a forgiven soul. It's the overflow of a forgiven soul. I was rotten and corrupt. I had a black heart. My thoughts and intentions were on evil continuously every day. And I didn't become good on my own. I'm still not good. But every good thing in me is because Jesus and because of the blood and because of the cross and because of the nails. When we remember, when we intentionally remind ourselves and remind one another where we were, where we are, and where we're going. If you've been blessed to be raised in the gospel truth where you could have been, it should cause you to worship. It should cause you to be thankful. It should cause us to offer our lives unto him. Which brings us back to our text this morning. The time for the crucifixion has come. Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. His disciples have prepared a place for the Passover feast and they've gathered in the upper room. They've celebrated the Passover together before, but they all had a sense that this Passover was different. We are in Jerusalem, the capital city, where Pilate and Herod are. They believed Jesus was soon to overthrow the Romans and reclaim the throne of Israel and rule in the place of his great ancestor, David. They had been for some time now, if you read the Gospels, jockeying for position in this new kingdom. Lord, we know you'll be the king, but I think I'd make a pretty good prime minister. Could I sit on your right hand? And, and could my brother, could my, could my son sit on your right and your left? The other disciples were like, hey, what about me? I'm good too. They're all anticipating a new kingdom that overthrows an old kingdom. Can I sit on your right hand? Can I be second in command? Can I have positions and authority? They didn't understand that Jesus had come to set up a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom without borders. A kingdom without end. A kingdom without ethnicity or race. Jesus had come to conquer not thrones and crowns, but to conquer hearts and minds. So they didn't quite understand when he said, I've desired to eat this Passover with you but I won't be eating it anymore. I will not have this meat anymore. And I will not have 
to drink of this cup anymore. He was saying, fellas, it's almost time. I'm going to die. This kingdom would not be established by spilling the blood of many soldiers on scattered battlefields, but by the blood of one man would this kingdom be established, the blood of Christ Jesus. There would be no battlefields, no sieges, no blockades, but the king of the newly found kingdom would simply die. He would purchase his kingdom, the church, with his own blood. Verse 17, we read a moment ago, said, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He said, I'll do the dying. I'll give my body and my blood. I'll pay the price and the debt. I'll set you free. But don't forget. Don't forget to remember. This isn't in my, my notes, but in the, the preparation just days, just, just a short time before the crucifixion, Jesus and his disciples are having dinner and, and uh, uh, Jesus gets out a, a pail of water and a towel and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And, and Peter says, no, Lord, you, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus is trying to explain that to be the Lord, to be the leader, you have to be a servant. And Jesus says something so almost harsh. He says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. Peter said, well, wash me from head to toe then, Lord. Jesus is trying to demonstrate something, Peter. Peter, you are about to be in charge I'm about to leave and I'm going to put the keys in your hands. Peter, when I, met, when I leave you in charge, you better not have the idea that you can't kneel and serve. You better not have the idea that you are a leader to serve. You better not have the idea that this church is for you to divide up and pass out and grow and, 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 and to gain fame and fortune for yourself. The point of the church is for you to serve, Peter. Jesus wants the disciples to know, listen, this church thing is going to grow. It's going to grow. It's going to expand on the day of Pentecost. There was going to be 3,000 added to the church. A few chapters later, 5,000 then added daily, then multiplying. The church is going to go global. There's going to be there's going to be all sorts of uh, powerful uh, apostles coming into the church. There's going to be Apollos, and there's going to be Paul, and there's going to be Silas, and you're going to have victories and victories, and you're going to take territories, and you're going to plant churches, and, and your names are going to become famous around the world, maybe infamous in some places. And, and, but that's not what it's about. It's not about you. Do it in remembrance of me. It's about him. It's about Jesus. It's about his blood. It's about his body. Do it in remembrance of me. When you plant that church, when you take that new territory, when you baptize that new apostle, do it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of me. When times get tough, you don't think you're gonna make it, remember, he died for you. When you're walking in blessing and favor, don't forget that he died for you. When you're serving God to the fullest, remember it's because he died for you. When you're struggling with your faith and you're thinking about giving up, don't give up and don't forget to remember the cross and the nails and the crown of thorns. Remember the blood. Remember the blood. Remember the broken body of Jesus and press on. Come on, would you lift your hands unto the Lord? 
don't forget to remember. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. One day when I was lost, he died on that cross. I know it was the blood saved me. How could I forget what he's done for me? How could I forget how he set me free? How could I forget how he brought me out? How can I forget? No, never. The blood that Jesus shed for us, it's still reaching, it's still flowing, it's still touching. Everything we do here would be wasteful and insignificant, but the blood, but the cross, but the empty tomb is still at work in our lives. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. When you got victory, it's because of him. When you come out, come out on the other side, it's because of him. When you've got joy in the storm, it's because of him. Researchers tell us there are many ways to practice remembering. I would like to encourage us to implement two of those. First is repetition. Repetition, as they say, is the mother of all learning. You probably won't learn it the first time, but second time, the third time, we're going to go over it. We're going we're gonna to sing a, the ABCs. We're gonna, a is for apple, B is for boy. We're, repetition, repetition, repetition. That's how we'll learn, repetition. That's why we preach about the cross and we sing about the blood and we celebrate the cross and we tell the story of the sacrifice and we teach it to our children when they're rising up and when they're laying their heads to rest we're telling them and we teach it in Sunday school and we teach it in youth service and we preach it on Sunday morning and we teach about it on Wednesday night we talk about it in the home and we talk about it in the car and we talk about it on the job and we talk about it with our friends and our families and our co-workers I know it might seem repetitive I, I know it seems like Christianity 101 it's the basics is there anything else we can talk about and of course there is but we're going to talk about the cross and the blood and the nails and the spear in the side and the death and the burial and the resurrection because it's how we remember it's how we remember I heard I heard uh, brother Joel Urshan say once he said a, 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 a different denomination pastor said to him once he said Pentecostals only got about five or six things they ever preach about you know, they preach about baptism and the Holy Ghost and faith and worship and, and miracles and that. that's about it. And he said, no, no, you misunderstand. We don't preach about five or six things. We only preach about one thing. We only preach about Jesus. And when we're talking about miracles, it's about Jesus. When we're talking about holiness, it's about Jesus. When we're talking about sins washed away, it's about Jesus. When we're talking about deliverance and freedom and, and, and healing and prosperity, it's about Jesus. It's about him. It's how we remember him would you stand to your feet Jesus didn't just say remember me but he said in as oft as you do this do it in remembrance of me Jesus taught us when you take communion when you take the bread and when you take the cup Remember the cross. In some Christian traditions, and this is not meant to be a comparison or to be denigrating in any way, I'm sure there are merits to this. But in some tr Christian traditions, they take communion every time they come together. That has never been our pattern. One of the reasons is, is we would never want it to become mechanical or traditional, or just a part of the service schedule. Open with prayer, sing a fast song, sing a slow song, do communion, have a little sermon, go home. We don't want that to happen. 
when we take communion, we want to remember. It's not about the cup. It's not about the bread. It's not about the words that will be spoken. It's about remembering. I want to remember. So we repeat it, we repeat it, we repeat it. But the second, the second way researchers tell us that we can remember things is through visualization. If I can put a picture with the definition that I'm trying to remember, if I can put a face to the name, if I can, if I can see a geographical location to, to support the event, maybe I can begin to imagine it, begin to visualize it, often in prayer. I try to visualize in great detail. I try to imagine Jesus kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane and saying, Lord, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if not, not my will, but thine be done. Try to imagine him praying with such intensity that great drops of blood as the capillaries in his face begin to burst. His sweat and his tears begin to bleed down his face. I try to remember what it must have felt like for Judas to walk in from that crowd and his friend, his hand-picked friend, reaching out and kissing him to betray him. I try to remember what it would be like. I try to visualize what it would be like as they led him to a whipping post. They tore open his shirt. They took a cat of nine tails and they beat Jesus mercilessly so that he could be bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions. I try to remember the stripes that would form on his back because it's by his stripes that we are healed. Right now, it's only occurring to me, it's so frustrating when I'm falsely accused of something, when somebody claims I did something I didn't do. What must it have felt like for Jesus to stand amongst his accusers as they called him a blasphemer and they called him a heretic and a liar and they mocked him and they spit on him and they slapped him but he answered them not a word I try to visualize I, I have an image in my mind of a dark night as Pilate brings Jesus out on the courtyard steps and there's a crowd gathered and he says, would you like Barabbas or would you like Jesus? In Christ's humanity, surely he must have thought they're going to want me to be set free. Barabbas is a scoundrel. He's a terrorist. He's evil. What it must have felt like to hear his own countrymen who he came to, but they knew him not as they cried out, give us Barabbas. try to visualize as he took that heavy cross beam because I don't want to forget I don't want to forget in all the church in the suits and ties and in the music and the lights and the, and the, and the, the teams and the, the small groups and the welcome to the family I, I don't want to forget what it's all about I don't want to forget what it's for I don't want to forget what we're trying to do he carried a cross up Calvary's hill and they nailed nails into his hands and his feet. And they crushed a crown of thorns onto his head. And as if that wasn't enough, someone drove a spear into his side. Blood and water flowed. I want to remember. I want to remember. Today when we take communion, don't let it be a tradition. Don't let it just be the close of another service. Don't let it just be what we do on Sunday mornings, but take a moment and remember. 
visualize. Would you lift your hands all over this place? Would you lift your hands? Without, without my prompting or my leading, would you just take a moment and remember? If Thanksgiving wells up in your heart, Thanksgiving wells up in your heart and you just want to let it out, just go ahead and let it out. Just go ahead and begin to give God praise that he's worthy of. It's the praise that he's earned. It's the praise that he deserves. Come on, church. Come on, church. We're going to do communion here in just a moment. I'm going to welcome pastor back to give us the elements. But right now, come on, remember. Remember, remember, remember as he cried out, it is finished. Remember as he gave up the ghost. Remember, remember. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He could have chose another way, but he chose to die for us. He could have just, he could have just saved the righteous. He could have just saved the good. He, he could have just picked those that were deserving, but he picked me and he picked you. He found me while I was in Egypt. He found me when I was a bondman and a slave. He found me. I want to remember. Remember. at this time would you take the the elements and make your way down to this altar would you come right now would you come I'm inviting everyone inviting everyone let's gather as a family as a church as Christians as people who were set free and made new by the blood of the lamb who was set free by the lamb slain from the foundations of the world would you come come bring the bread and bring the cup in your hand as you come hallelujah hallelujah the blood that Jesus shed for me. some room for those that are coming behind you please come closer coming behind you make some room it will never lose it's power for it reaches to the highest today is as you heard the word remembering his death the crowning event of his earthly ministry we're not saved by his miracles we're not saved by his life his teachings we're saved by his atoning sacrifice on the cross and so this time of remembrance this where we look and we focus the Bible says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Therefore, communion sets forth the atonement, even the blessings included in the incarnation are imparted to us through the death of Jesus Christ. One thing that we're asked to do in the scriptures is that we are asked to examine ourselves. So would you just, before we take communion, every eye closed, I want you just to examine yourself. I want you to ask God. I want you to repent. Let's all, why don't we all just repent? It's what we do daily anyways. God, we ask that you would forgive us. God, that you would forgive us for our sins. 
Forgive us, God, for everything that we've done, sins of omission and sins of commission. Even the things we should have done that we didn't do. We pray, God, that if there's anything, search me, God. If there's any wicked way in me, God, let me come to the cross, God, where the cross can can destroy all of the sin and everything can be taken away and you can nail it to your cross, we pray in the name of Jesus. 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 We examine ourselves today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. At the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. Well, it was there by faith I received my sight. And now from the cup and prepare to take communion together I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Paul writing he says I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and he said take and eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the Lord's death until he come. And so today in remembrance of his death and in remembrance of the body that was broken, the body that was nailed to that cross for my sins, we take the bread together. Hallelujah. After the same manner all, so he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do it as oft as you do it in remembrance of me. And so now we take the cup together. Would you join me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you lift your voice today and lift your hands? Lift your hearts? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus oh what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus and what can make me Jesus. 